Okay. Well, maybe just a reminder to, um, unless you're speaking, to please mute yourselves. Thanks. And we'll get going. I think we should get going, Caitlin. What do you think? You think so? Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks to everyone for being here on this Wednesday morning. Um, and thanks again to our fabulous panel. I'm going to introduce everyone and then we'll pass it over to Caitlin for the presentation. So we will have a presentation to start with and then we hope to have at least 20 minutes for Q&A at the end. So if you would like to type your questions into the chat, feel free to do that or save them for after um, during the Q&A. I think it's also fun to have like an actual discussion, more of a conversation, right? Okay, cool. All right, so um, I am your moderator today and I would like to welcome our panel. Uh, we have Stephanie Salzman, as Manager of Marketing and Communications at Brunner Cott Architects. Do you know what, I should turn the music off, sorry. Sorry about that. Stephanie focuses on furthering the firm's reach and recognition using storytelling that is compelling and authentic. Working closely with firm leadership, she has helped cultivate an integrated communication strategy that promotes the firm's transformational design work through awards, conferences and presentations, publications, social media, and web content. Her efforts have contributed to projects at the national, regional, and local levels, including honor awards for design excellence and interior architecture, and, an, and a Harleston Parker Medal from the Boston Society of Architects building of the year recognition from the Architects newspaper and an interior architecture award from the American Institute of Architects. Welcome, Stephanie, thanks for being here. Also, I'm introducing Anna Whistler. Anna is a PR specialist for the Boston studio of Perkins and Will, where she works hand in hand with studio leadership to develop and execute a holistic communication strategy that encompasses photography, awards, social media, thought leadership and media relations. She has helped to secure top tier recognition for the studio's design work, including the cover story of Architectural Record, the Harleston Parker People's Choice Award, and honor awards for design excellence. Thanks for being here, Anna. And um, we have Caitlin Hart, who will be manning the presentation today. Caitlin Hart is the program manager at the BSA. She de develops and facilitates educational sessions and series with a special interest in environmental issues and she also manages the annual design awards program. Caitlin is always looking for ways that these programs can deliver greater impact and value for our community. Please don't hesitate to reach out to her. And her email address is on the BSA website, correct? Yes, I can drop them in the chat later. Too. Okay, great. All right, over to you, thanks. Cool, um, thank you so much, Sandy, Anna, and Stephanie, um, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. I'm going to do um, hopefully a brief overview of submission requirements, categories and deadlines, and jury processes and any updates in those groups. Um, and then I'll hand it over to you, um, Anna and Steph, and then we can have tons of time for Q and A. Um, and as Sandy said, this can be a conversation. So I may be um, talking quickly to try and breeze through this all, but um, don't hesitate to stop me with questions. Um, all right, so first up, submission requirements. Um, but first kind of an overall look at the schedule. So as many of you know, we uh, kind of shifted our typical design awards schedule to later in the year, last year because of the pandemic. And it seems to work well. So we're sticking with it again this year. Again, I welcome feedback on anything and everything. So uh, including this schedule, but for 2021, um, we'll be sticking with this schedule. So submissions are now open. Uh, deadlines fall throughout the month of August. The juries will meet in fall. Uh, and then the announcement and recognition of winning projects will take place kind of as juries make their decisions with our um, annual celebration taking place in January. The format of that is still, is still TBD. Um, as you all probably know too, the submission platform will remain the same. It's open water. It's the same that um, AI National uses. It's a pretty intuitive uh, platform as far as the user interface goes. 
Okay, so um, the submission requirements remain mostly the same. However, there are a few updates. So um, this year, we'll be integrating the AIA's framework for design excellence into the submission forms for all of our awards categories, except for the Harleston Parker Medal, which is totally its own thing, and the Unbuilt Design Awards, because um, the framework asks for a lot of data and it's not really fair to ask that of unbuilt projects. Um, so we piloted this with our Sustainable Design Awards last year. It will apply to um, seven of our nine categories this year, and we're asking that folks address at least three of the 10 principles that are laid out in the framework for design excellence. Um, we hope this isn't too onerous for you all. I think there, um, you know, there are a number of principles that are harder and require are pretty data intensive, but there are a number that that should be able to apply to any project. Um, so you'll see a new kind of submission form for for most of the categories. And it's the same one that the AI uses for their architecture awards. Um, also new this year, the BSA has kind of solidified uh, three impact areas, and those are advancing architecture, environment, and equity. And so in your project description or your kind of project narrative, we'll ask that you address at least one of these three impact areas in kind of the storytelling of your project. Um, you can do this implicitly or explicitly, uh, and I think many of you are already doing this, have been doing this for years, right? These categories kind of aren't new. Um, all right, so that's a brief update on submission requirements. Now the categories and deadlines, I'm going to move quickly through this because a lot of this information is available elsewhere. Uh, the BSA has probably the most robust design awards program that any AI chapter does with many, many categories. Um, most of those alternate, so they run every other year. Um, and I've just highlighted here the, the ones that are running this year. Uh, we also have project categories that run annually. Those include our Harleston Parker Medal, which is the most prestigious award that the BSA gives, meant to recognize the most beautiful new building in Boston. The Honor Awards for Design Excellence, which is kind of a catch-all category, uh, meant to recognize the best of the best. Unbuilt architecture and design, which is more theoretical, often experimental and out there, um, and new this year because the BSA is kind of um, has made concrete those values, including the value of environment. We're making sustainable design um, an annual category. Okay, um, so. Again, I'm going to run through these quickly. Please stop me if you if you need to. Um, the Accessible Design Awards will run this year. It's a program of the Massachusetts Architectural Access Board. So we partner with them and the BSA's Access Committee. Um, it recognizes public architecture, private and residential, as well as historic preservation. Um, in 2019, we kind of broke education facilities design into two different categories, K through 12 and higher education. So this will be the first year that higher education runs as its own category. And that split was kind of based on feedback from submitters, but mostly jurors that it was very hard to kind of judge in one pool, um, these two very different project types. Hospitality Design Awards was a new category in 2018, and it will be um, running again in 2021. Uh, similar to the Education Facilities Design Awards, Housing Design once was uh, encompassed both multifamily housing and residential design awards. We decided to split those out as well for the same reasons. So. Um, last year, residential design ran as its own category, and this year, housing design will mean multifamily housing design. So we're looking at um, projects with five or more units. And um, this <clears throat> is both housing design and residential design um, are in partnership with A New York. So we have some um, healthy competition from our colleagues in New York. 
Small Firms Design Awards will run. Um, I want to be explicit that this is for firms with 10 or fewer employees total, not 10 designers or fewer, 10, 10 total members of the firm. Um, sustainable Design Awards. I have nothing. I have nothing more to say here. Although I think this um, category will become increasingly competitive. Again, Honor Awards for Design Excellence is a catch-all. It welcomes all project types. It is typically juried by another AI chapter. That chapter is to be determined, but um, we usually shop out the jurying to avoid local biases and kind of elevate the category by getting um, perspectives from around the country. And the Unbuilt Architecture and Design Awards, um, these used to require a physical board. Last year, because of the pandemic, we switched to all digital. Um, the submissions will remain all digital this year. Uh, and again, this is the kind of regular category to which the framework for design excellence will, will not be applied. And briefly, the Harleston Parker Medal, I'll put a plug. Um, the deadline for nominations is this Friday. We have a list of, I wanna say, between 95 and 100 projects, um, but I encourage you to, to nominate. The nomination is super easy. It just takes um, the project name, location if you know it, firm if you know it, and that's that. So if you have any building that your, your firm has done or anyone else has done, um, please feel free to nominate it. Um, and I won't, I won't talk too much more about this award process right now. Um, and finally, the jury processes. So um, new this year, we'll be putting out kind of an open call for jurors. Um, a lot of people ask kind of how juries are selected and that's a really good question. So typically it's been me going to relevant knowledge community co-chairs, uh, me going to my colleagues and sorry for any extra background noise. It's unfortunately garbage day in my neighborhood. Um, I'll try to talk quick before the truck comes. Um, so, um, so yeah, uh, knowledge community co-chairs, my colleagues, um, recommendations from past jurors. But this year, we want to cast a wider net. We want to actually ask who is interested. So I'm, I'm also pitching um, this call for jurors to you all. I know there are folks in your firm, firms who would make wonderful jurors. Um, keep an eye out for the call coming in May next month. And the only stipulation is that jurors um, can't jury a category that their firm is submitting to. Um, also new to the jury process, um, for the past few years, we've asked for firm pro profile and demographics, including uh, racial representation, ethnic representation, gender representation. Um, we've also asked for firms to identify any diversity certifications they've had, so MBE, WBE, et cetera. Um, in the past, we haven't shared this with jurors, but we are going to share them this year. And I'll admit this is a, a new kind of experimental thing. It's not required. So not all entries will have this information attached um, to their submission, but it's all in an effort to kind of um, commit to equity in the profession to have kind of a more transparent process. Um, and to really fill out the story um, of the submitting firm and the project being submitted. So I will, I will fully admit um, this will be kind of a year of feeling out how this factors into the um, submission process. Um, but I wanted to share that with you all to, to let you know it will be done and hopefully to, to get some feedback. Um, again, we'll be, um, including the Framework for Design Excellence submission form. And um, you may be wondering what this looks like as part of the, the jury process. So um, I think this is actually a really great step in the right direction to give some clarity to the criteria um, on which projects are judged. So in the past, um, we've had this very kind of nebulous um, 
the sole criterion is design excellence as determined by the jury, right? And that could mean anything. Um, so the framework introduces these 10 principles. We'll ask you to, again, address a minimum of three. And then um, there will be kind of a rubric by which the jury gives very basic scores to um, the strength of information presented um, in kind of each of these buckets. And again, this is a new process. Um, so it will, it will take a little feeling out um, and I appreciate everyone's patience as we kind of figure out the best way to, to um, include these elements in the decision making. Again, to reiterate um, that we're asking you all to address the one of three at minimum BSA impact areas in kind of the project narrative. Um, this won't be a hard criterion, um, but uh, in the jury comments, we'll be looking to highlight kind of how winning projects address at least one of these. So make sure make sure these are kind of in the story of your project. And um, I think environment and equity are pretty straightforward. Advancing architecture, again, could be interpreted in many ways. But based on the juries that I've um, listened in on, um, advancing architecture in my mind, and I think in many jurors' minds, um, is kind of innovation um, in whatever form it takes, right? Practice, processes, materials, form, um, what have you, anything that kind of pushes either the profession or the product of the profession and its impacts forward. Okay, that was a lot of me talking very fast at you. Um, I know we'll have time for questions at the end, so please drop any questions in the chat or share afterward. And um, now I'll turn it over for hopefully some more, uh, more fun presentations. Um, and I think that Steph from Brunicott will share next. Just give me a moment. <laughs> of course. Okay, uh, Caitlin, do we want to have Anna go first? I'm having a little trouble for some reason. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, sorry about that. Uh, if you want to email me your presentation to Steph, I'm happy to drive. Okay. Anna, are you are you all set to go? Yeah, yeah, okay. totally. Thanks. Okay. Take it away. Okay, so I'm hoping that everyone can now see my screen. Give me a shout if you can't. Okay, got the thumbs up. Um, all right, so thank you, Caitlin and Sandy, for giving us a uh, some introductions. Um, as they said, I work at Perkins and Will, and I am very fortunate to have a bit of a unique role in our world, which is that I focus entirely on communications. Um, so I get to be a little bit separated from um, a lot of the other marketing work, and that allows me to um, take a maybe a different approach to how we do awards in particular. Um, I know that's not the case for many firms, but hopefully some of uh, what I'm about to share is still useful um, as, as something new to consider. So um, our process in an ideal world um, happens kind of along the project process. Um, so before the project opens, um, we really try to start and uncover what the key stories are. Um, from the team. So uh, usually that looks like me interviewing many different members of the design team to kind of try and dig out what are the really impressive, important stories to tell. Um, and a lot of times that's a, one of the key steps in the process because our team has been three inches away from a project for three years and it's hard for them to take a step back and really see what's been impressive the whole time and to, to remember what the award-winning stories are in the project. Um, so that's always a fun, a fun part before we even think about um, when the project is opening or, or photography. Um, so then once we have the stories 
considered, that's when we start to think about the visuals that we need to illustrate the stories. Um, some narratives kind of stand on their own, but others you need to really see in a space. And so what photography, drawings, and diagrams will we need to be able to illustrate these interesting, impressive stories? Um, after that, we uh, that's when we kind of take a step back and, and really write the narrative. And hopefully this coincides with the project opening so that it can um, serve the purpose of outward facing, um, you know, a press release or thought leadership around the project. Um, but then really we, we have our writing that coincides with photography and visuals we've collected and stories we've identified as the most important. Um, and then really the last step on this is the award submission. So in an ideal world, we've already done a lot of the legwork before the award process comes around. Um, and that helps us from doing the last minute scramble that I'm sure everyone is too familiar with um, when the awards deadline doesn't come in an ideal time with the project opening. Um, so this isn't always possible, but when, when we can, this is the process we try to follow. Um, and then equally important to the process, I think, is the players who are at the table. Um, we're really lucky, like I said, that um, I get to be involved in this process every step of the way and kind of understand a project front to back. Um, but also really important that we engage our design leadership in almost every um, project opening photography process that, that we engage in. So that could be the design director or the interior design director, um, but it could really be anyone in the studio who takes a design leadership role. And then beyond them, um, as many people from the project team as possible. So um, it could be somebody who worked exclusively on you know, furniture or it could be the project manager, but everyone usually has a really interesting tidbit to share um, that if you only talk to one person, you really miss out on some of those interesting um, facets of the project that sometimes turn out to inform you know, the main stories. And then lastly is um, an outsider. We sometimes joke about this as the designated normal human. So asking someone who is not a designer, who doesn't speak architectural jargon, who maybe isn't even a marketing person um, to really take a look at the materials that you've put together and um, see if it makes sense, see if the story is cohesive and coherent and um, get that outside view. Um, so I'll walk you through an example, which is Bill Rickham Memorial High School. Um, this project is, has done a really phenomenal, um, made a phenomenal impact on the community. And um, I think that the, the project stands on its own. Um, and we've been really fortunate to receive a lot of recognition for this project in the past um, two or so years. Um, hopefully, hopefully more to come. Um, and, and I will say that um, you have to give credit where credit is due. And this was just a really phenomenal team effort, um, the design team and the, um, the client engagement throughout the process, I think is what um, really ended up producing such a wonderful project that it was, it made the marketing side of things really easy because there were, there were just naturally great stories to tell. Um, and so it was, there was no kind of um, fabrication or trying to make something out of nothing. It was, there was a lot of great material to work with. Um, and so kind of stepping through that four part process that I talked about um, with this project in particular, it was really clear from the beginning that community transformation was going to be kind of like the core story that we wanted to talk about. And that permeated all different aspects of the project that was community transformation in the branding that was done. It was community transformation in the way that the building was designed to host town events and town activities from the time school starts all the way till six, seven, eight o'clock at night. Um, and in the way that um, the building allowed teachers to kind of change the way that they taught and be ready for future changes to come. So we knew from the get-go that community transformation was something we were really gonna want to be able to speak about and be able to show in our visuals. So then thinking about what visuals we needed to show, it really is a close um, relationship between the photography and the diagrams. So we knew that we needed to capture some of these new types of learning spaces in use and the way that um, they, they exist in the school, but also um, the design team did a great job of creating diagrams that illustrated something we could have never captured with the camera um, that really show how um, this space at the intersection of three classrooms could um, in the future be a hub for students in a French algebra and biology class to work together on um, 
opening a French bistro, pricing it and setting the menu. So it's really um, showing, showcasing how the project was intended to be used through a mixture of these, these mediums. And then after that is when we kind of really drilled down into what the narrative um, wanted to say, being very clear about how the project is designed to serve the, the community now, but then also um, sort of having this aspirational idea of how we hope the project may um, empower the teachers and the students to use the space in the future. Um, and I would definitely say that the, the narrative um, didn't really get polished and, and perfected um, until after we had kind of the visuals that we knew what we were kind of trying to describe. Um, and then lastly, um, in this process is the submission. So um, these are two subsequent pages in um, the K through 12 uh, educational facilities design category that we submitted last year. And you can see how um, the diagrams kind of set you up for what the idea is um, that right now the the classrooms are organized in a departmental way in the future that can become interdisciplinary and then the photography really supports that message um, rather than trying to just use all of the photography that documents every single space that that you've had so um, this was a great example of how this a project that was able to follow that um, kind of linear and systematic approach um, and and successfully so um, but um, I think that it, it serves even for us as a great example of, of a process we want to emulate with all projects when we can moving forward um, because it, it was successful in really conveying um, what the most important parts of the project were um, and, and hopefully the impact that it has on the community. So um, that's all I have to share with you today. If, if there are any questions, um, I think that we'll, we'll take those after. Stephanie or in the chat. Thank you, Anna. That's such an inspiring project. So it was really nice to be walked through um, the submission. Um, all right, so I'm going to share on behalf of Stephanie. Uh, give me just a moment, folks. All right. All right, thanks, Stephanie. Just direct me. All right, perfect. Uh, thanks, Caitlin. And thank you, everyone, for uh, bearing with me. I feel like Zoom never works where you want it to when it's, uh, when it's go time, but that's fine. <laughs> um, uh, so I am the manager of marketing communications at Brunica Architect. Um, if you aren't familiar, we are a 30 person ish uh, single office practice located on Friend Street in Boston, um, right near the garden. Uh, the North Station, <clears throat> excuse me. We serve a variety of higher education, um, institutional, cultural, and developer clients all across the, North, the Northeast, excuse me. Um, and we were founded 49 years ago with a commitment to design excellence and uh, designing a more sustainable and equitable future. Um, uh, Caitlin, next. Um, so here's a very high level overview of um, our firm's experience submitting to BSA and AIA awards. Um, I like to keep them together. I think the submissions kind of go hand in hand and the processes are very similar, especially now um, as we're starting to integrate the AIA framework uh, for design excellence into the BSA submission. Um, I obviously cannot take credit for all of these awards. Uh, they span back over about 20 years. I could take credit for uh, the first column and that's about it um but i've learned a lot um submitting over and over year after year project project um that was you uh next um so the main project i'm going to show you is mass mocha um building six if you know one project that Bruno Crott did it's probably mass mocha um it's the firm's seminal work we've been chipping away at it for about 25, almost 30 years now between the master plan and um, renovating different buildings. Um, building six finished in 2017, 130 square feet, um, adaptive reuse project in a former industrial mill building. Uh, building six was finishing as I joined Brunner Cot. So um, we were rolling out 
press releases with our PR consultant. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Um, you know, it was the first website I, I apologies, the first project I really started to promote on our website and social media. Um, and was kind of my introduction to submitting for awards. Um, luckily, it is a incredible project that resonates with a lot of different people um, and qualifies for a lot of different things. So we've been pretty lucky. Um, has long legs and it's a very decorated um, project. Most recently, it won um, an honor award for interior architecture from the BSA. Next. Um, so here's just kind of a quick overview of our process. Um, it begins with awards planning um, internally. Our marketing department is uh, myself and one of our partners, Dana Kelly. Um, we kind of pull ourselves up by our bootstraps at times. So we're always kind of planning ahead. Um, we have an awards calendar that we maintain and update. It's um, a cloud-based Excel document that we track um, deadlines, fees, criteria, um, anything you need to know, and also past victories and potential future projects you might submit for. Um, so we really start by thinking about the big picture um, and looking at the year as a whole. And then we meet regularly um, a couple of times a quarter just to move things along as deadlines approach, projects finish, um, we start thinking about photography and things like that. Um, next is research and prep, which is different from planning, um, <laughs> a little more in depth. Um, you're gonna do research on your projects, but also the awards you're submitting for, um, including like the juries, the submission criteria, um, past winners, and things like that. Then you will craft your submission, which is the tricky part. Um, and once you have something that you can look at, hold, um, comb through it like crazy and um, just keep refining and keep making it better. And I think that's how we found a lot of success um, in the awards programs is refining and revisiting content that we've already put together. Next. Um, so I touched on a little bit of this um, on the last slide, but our planning process, um, it's an ongoing thing as marketers in a relatively small firm, um, we wear a lot of hats, we juggle a lot of deadlines, um, it's very fast paced. So try and stay on top of awards uh, consistently so that deadlines don't sneak up on you and there's that last minute scramble. Um, so, you know, we update that database. I meet with Dana um, and we talk about potential fit and potential plans of action. Um, something we've started doing more recently is at the onset of a project, we'll start um, making target lists of awards that it might be a contender for. So we can start thinking about what kind of materials we need to pull together, um, what kind of graphics we might need, um, you know, who we should engage as a photographer, um, you know, where it's located, if it qualifies for a regional or a local award, things like that. Um, and then I start compiling as much information as I can um, right at the onset, um, square footage, program, consultant, anything that you might need to reuse later, I try and keep it all um, organized by projects just for myself. Um, and it helps me keep things straight. I use OneNote for that, um, but whatever works. <laughs> um, next. Um, next comes the research and preparation stage. Um, so once you kind of have your targets and your game plan set, um, we go in and we look at um, really granularly um, the submission requirements, jury criteria, things um, that are just important to keep in mind as you start crafting your submissions. Um, I like to pull out keywords and phrases to frame our thinking. Um, Something that's helped Mass Mocha is words like spectacular and transformative and really big, robust words that you'll see. Um, and you want to kind of craft your message to fit those big feelings you want the jury to feel. <laughs> um, and again, I research the jury, past winners. Um, I like to know kind of what I'm in for, what's been successful in the past, um, if they offer you know, to look at past submissions, that's great. Sometimes the AIA does that, um, uh, you know, just to get inspiration or just to see how people think about things a little differently. Um, 
I start to take stock of what we have. Um, if we have floor plans, but they need to be cleaned up, I'll make note of that or um, start thinking about photography or diagrams or any sort of graphic component um, that might take time or design staff's time. Um, you want to think of that the earlier, the better, of course. Um, and again, engage the design staff as early as you can. Um, we juggle deadlines, but so are they. And it can kind of be a struggle to get their full attention and get their input. So the more notice they have, the more likely you are to get them to engage with you and contribute in a more meaningful way. Um, and then log into the submission portal as soon as you're able to. Um, there are often these awesome PDFs with everything you need to know about submitting, but that's not always quite everything. So I like to log in and get myself set up with the project and all of the data um, that you have available and you know keep updating it just so that it's there and you're not scrambling to type it all in an hour before the deadline or something like that. Uh, next. Um, when we craft our submission, um, we try and keep it simple. Um, we're pretty old school in how we work, um, Word documents, craft changes. Um, now we're cloud-based, so it's a little bit easier, especially being remote, but um, just trying to make things accessible to everyone that's working on it is a big deal for us. Um, um, we try to engage the design staff as much as we can. Um, and also to, um, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You have project descriptions, you have social media posts, you have things that you already are crafting um, as a marketer anyways. So use those to your advantage, um, comb through your existing libraries, your existing collateral, um, and you'd be surprised what you can reuse and kind of reinvent um, based on what already exists. Um, I then go through and edit like crazy. Um, I like to read out loud sometimes, um, hearing things resonates a little differently than reading them. Um, and then the old explain it to me like I'm five. Um, I think a, a narrative is successful if I can summarize it to someone as if they are five years old and they can kind of understand it. Um, so the simpler, the better. You shouldn't need an advanced design degree to understand why Mass MoCA is a transformational project or a cool story. Um, it should be relatively universal, but still speak to those, um, the specific submission criteria. Um, next. Uh, there's also the graphic component of the submission. Um, so this is, I think, what takes the most time for us. Um, I was trying to be extremely intentional in what we're showing the judges. Um, we spend a lot of time going over the order of projects, uh, I'm sorry, the order of pages and content, um, and you know, really working through what the jury is going to see um, when they open up your submission. Um, we try and follow the five second rule. Um, if you can look at a page it, for five seconds and you can't figure it out, it still needs work. Um, you should be able to kind of figure out at least what you're trying to convey on your page, um, you know, at, at quick glance, you know, here we have um, this great diagram where you can see the different levels of Mass Mocha and right next to it is a vertical photo where you see those levels um, in actuality. And so I think um, just keeping it very simple, punchy, don't be afraid of white space um, and using captions um, is crucial just so that the jury can really absorb everything all at once. Um, here's just a few more examples of pages from the Math Mocha submission. Um, you know, always just very straightforward. You can tell a before and after, this is what this space used to look like. And this is this amazing intervention that we've done. Um, and it's important that the jury can recognize that. And so using before and after images or small plans to orient where you are in the museum um, only helps strengthen your story um, for the jury who may have never heard of Mass Mocha or your project or, you know. <laughs> uh, next. Um, yeah, so just in summary, um, my approach is to work smarter, not harder. Um, you know, we, we have all this great stuff and we're constantly working to promote our projects, um, improve our marketing collateral. 
we put this stuff in proposals. So, um, you know, I really try and work with what's existing and then expand on that. Um, and, you know, just try not to kill yourself before, before a big deadline. <laughs> Um, if it first don't succeed, revise and resubmit. Um, Mass Mocha finished in 2017, but it's 2021 and it's still winning awards. So, um, you know, be nimble and agile and adapt um, as you, you know the project ages. You can enhance your story. Um, it's not outdated. It's you can um, just kind of roll with whatever is happening and adjust your narrative. Um, also, juries change um, and opinions change and one project that resonates with one person might not resonate with someone else. So um, that's also why it's important to research the juries and just kind of know who's looking at these projects, because if you didn't have success in a previous year, um, you might have success during the next one. Um, and the next tip is just pay really close attention to the project eligibility requirements. Um, for instance, if a project has to have been completed after a certain date. Um, but you might be surprised that older projects still have legs um, and you can kind of breathe new life into those old submissions. Um, for instance, we had a project, um, the Leslie University Lunder Art Center. Um, it finished in 2016 and it won a bunch of preservation awards, um, some local awards, but it wasn't winning any design awards. Um, so we went back and we totally redid the narrative um, retold the story and then it actually started picking back up again. So, um, you know, paying attention to which programs kind of have bigger windows or, you know, what the BSA's regulations are can really help you um, extend the life of some of your older projects. I think that's it. Thank you. Terrific, thank you so much. This was wonderful. I'd like to open this up for questions. I don't know if we have a few in the chat or no. I yeah, there was a good one from um, from Katie Long, which I think I think would be nice to hear from folks on. It's about the diagrams that uh, you both showed, Anna and, and Stephanie. Are your diagrams typically created specifically for award submissions, or are they already on hand? For us, it's kind of a combination of both. Um, for instance, projects that have. Uh, longer like public processes or more public hearings, the design team is usually pumping out diagrams or plans um, for those presentations anyways. Um, so sometimes you can kind of crib from there. Um, but other times we do ask specifically, can you um, alter this plan or create this diagram to show these spaces? Uh, so it kind of depends on the project for us. I would agree with that. I think that it's it's definitely a mixture of things that have been used in client meetings, client facing meetings, but also um, even just sketches that the design team has used to kind of iterate on an idea. Um, sometimes we'll uncover something like that and say, okay, we just need to polish this because this really captures the idea. Um, so sometimes it can be some of that process work that becomes a diagram, um, but often there is a final polish before it goes into a, an award submission. I actually have a question for you both um, because submissions are digital now. You're paying more attention to your choice of fonts and how legible they are on the screen for, for people who are just reading your material off the screen. Yeah, I think I think in some ways um, it feels like digital makes gives more possibilities. Um, people can always zoom in, mm -hmm. um, and so in in some ways you can show. I think we try to remain relatively consistent with a, a font size that reads well on a printed sheet of paper. Should something be printed, but um, sometimes there are. Uh, drawings or diagrams that uh, you really kind of want to zoom into. And in, in that case, I think sometimes we feel more comfortable putting something with a little bit more detail, knowing that um, someone could zoom into it and take a closer look because it is a digital document. I would completely echo that. Hi, 
have a question. Um, when you were going through your slides, Stephanie, and also you, Anna, um, you, uh, there was a there was a bit about um, you know working with firm leadership to determine which projects would be submitted for which awards. Um, I have in the past experienced a challenge in exactly that, deciding which projects to submit for which awards, and we've worked in committee to make that decision. Very challenging. Um, we've created a small group of decision makers, very exclusionary. Um, I haven't found a really good way to, um, to make that call yet. And I'd love to know more about that part of your processes, both of you. Um, for us, um, I think we're pretty lucky um, in that we have three partners who are our primary decision makers. Um, one of which I work directly with, uh, Dana Kelly. Um, and Dana has a lot of sway. <laughs> so it helps, you know, to have her on your side. Um, and, you know, she and I talk about these things really in depth and then we'll bring them to um, Jason and Jason and our other partners and kind of say, this is what we wanna do. This is why we wanna do it. Um, and I think we've had a lot of luck and success in just having like open conversations about it. Um, so far, we haven't had any crazy disagreements of no, we shouldn't submit this or we should submit this instead of this. Um, it's all just been very um, open and conversational. I think in our case, there are a couple of things that that help. One is the, you know, rigorous tracking that you do of noting what projects have been submitted for three or four years now and haven't um, been recognized. Um, sometimes that is an invitation to kind of reinvent the submission like Stephanie was saying, but sometimes that's also um, kind of our cue that we should focus our attention on um, a more recent project, um, that this one might just not be resonating in the way that we'd like it to. Um, but I also think that one of the benefits of working at such a large firm is that we have kind of an immediate litmus test to hold projects up against. Um, that there typically isn't too much disagreement about um, what projects to submit because we can kind of easily compare it with other projects in the firm and understand um, how it stacks up in terms of its memorability or what, what the story is to tell. So I think that, that um, if, if you're not in a firm that has you know, that kind of portfolio to stack against, just comparing against projects that have won awards um, for the past couple of years, and seeing, you know, can I kind of see this project in that field? Um, does it kind of feel like it's in the right, um, the, the right category and the right level of recognition? I think um, just kind of a quick gut, gut test um, is often really helpful. I have a question for you both about um, visual design tools that you use to collaborate with your teams. Do you have anything in particular or do you just do mock-ups and send them PDFs or do you use like a virtual whiteboard like Miro or something where you can have, interact with the visuals together? I think it really, and, and again, this is um, a unique perspective because we are fairly large. So um, we work with different kinds of teams and try to accommodate what works best for them. So. Um, I worked with a team recently who built the entire submission in Miro. Um, and then once we agreed on layout and content, it was handed over to me and I translated it into InDesign and really kind of put the final polish on it. Um, in other cases, um, I'm kind of owning the process from start to finish in InDesign and kind of sending first a shell of a document to the team for, for consideration. And then we, we iterate on it together. Um, I think it, it really, I think it depends on finding what the strength is of the team that you're working with. Some people need to be hands-on and kind of make that Miro board storyboard themselves um, before they can really buy into a project, uh, a submission. Um, whereas other teams are more comfortable um, with you knowing the story and, and giving some thought to how it's, how it's told. Exactly. Stephanie, how about you? Uh, with us, um, I kind of take ownership of the process, um, like Anna was saying, um, with the InDesign file um, and send it around, you know, for comments. Um, it's great. I learned how to import PDF comments directly into InDesign and make your edits that way. It has saved me so much time. <laughs> great. Um, 
We did start using Whiteboard, uh, Microsoft Whiteboard, a little bit after last year's presentation. Um, I think it, it was Lear's Wines Apple uh, who used it. And yes. it was so great. Um, I had no idea we even had it until that presentation. Um, and it's really helpful for discussing the order in which you want to showcase things um, and being able to slide things around um, and look at them all together. Like if you're sharing a screen with a small team or um, even just for your own benefit of needing to see it right in front of you. Great. Other questions from the group? If not, we might be wrapping up. What do you think? I had somebody send me one, but it was a direct message, not to everyone. Um, okay. So I'll ask that. Uh, and, and that was um, about economy of words. Um, and that, uh, I'm gonna paraphrase. Uh, some, uh, sometimes there's a struggle between writing in whole paragraph form and choosing bullets and really calling out you know, specific um, text descriptions. Given that juries have such limited time to read through so many awards. Um, I think some of us tend to look for brevity in our, in our written, the written portions of our submissions. How do you both approach that? Um, I'm a big fan of strategic bolding, <laughs> um, you know, key ideas. Um, if someone's gonna look at a page and I want them to get one point out of it, I need to make sure that they're gonna see it. Um, I'm not opposed to bullet points, but sometimes I do get I do feel like it's not polished enough um, and maybe that's just a personal thing, um, but we do start all of our writing in bullets. Um, that's kind of the easiest way to communicate back and forth with like the design team, um, especially if they're more technical in nature um, and less of a writer. Um, you know, they, these descriptions and um, text kind of start as these bulleted lists and eventually they kind of evolve into um, much nicer, Prose, um, if you will. We've taken both approaches, um, you know, kind of more sentences and paragraphs and other um, more bullet style writing. Um, and I think that both can work effectively for your project. I think the most important thing that we try to keep in mind, especially if we're um, working on a, taking like a bulleted approach, is just making sure that um, that that core overarching story is reinforced by each of the, the bullets in some way that, that everything is kind of in service of this greater um, narrative that you're trying to communicate. Um, I think that with, and, and that's always a very challenging thing to do, especially with, um, you know, the, the 10 uh, areas of the framework for design excellence. You know, there are a lot of categories that you need to you want to be hitting on that you think the more categories you hit on, um, maybe the more impressive your submission becomes. Um, so it's a challenging task, but I think um, the, the bullets can be effective if they are still kind of telling that consistent, coherent story. Caitlin, it occurs to me you might have a lot to say about this topic as well, uh, given how many awards you've seen come across the desk. Sure, yeah, I can't speak to um, the jury's experience. And I think that as we shifted from, um, but I can, yeah, I can make guesses, educated guesses. Um, I think as we've kind of seen this shift from, um, from the physical portfolios, which we were doing up until like 2017, which is kind of nuts, um, to the digital, um, jurors have homework ahead of time, right? So there's um, kind of their independent review of the materials during which jurors are very, like, I think more willing to absorb more text. And then there's the group review that said, um, you know, submissions range anywhere from like 15 submissions in a category to 130 in a category. So um, while while jurors are spending more total time with the submissions, um, econ economy of language is important. I think I'm just basically echoing what everyone what everyone else said um, and what Anna and Stephanie kind of laid out in their presentations that you want to have a clear narrative that um, folks can kind of easily absorb, um, a good story that folks can latch onto. And then if there's more like more that they want to know, they'll spend more time with it. On the flip side, um, 
uh, something that I have seen with many juries, especially with adaptive reuse projects um, and telling the story of before and after, right? You don't want jurors to be spending more time with a project because they're confused about like what the firm has done or what the point is. So yes, economy of language, but making sure it's um, uh, telling the full story in a very clear way rather than leaving kind of gaps of information. Clear and memorable. And there is another ch um, chat question from Susan Elmore. This is for Caitlin. Do all entries get jury comments? And if so, are they available to submitting firms after notification of non-selection? Um, unfortunately, the answer to this question is no, um, simply because of the quant like the volume of submissions um, and um, kind of the, yeah, the management of delivering those jury comments. I'll share that um, at least as the jury process has worked in the past, um, jurors, when they're doing their homework ahead of time, will typically assign kind of a yes, maybe no to all of the submissions they review. So yes, I think we should just consider this for an award, maybe no. Um, typically, if there's a project that kind of comes to the table and um, has all no's, that isn't discussed kind of in the, the phase two group meeting. So um, there aren't jury comments for all projects, um, unfortunately. Um, that said, I know another question I received from Susan um, that I'm not sure I addressed this year is a question um, kind of related, and I know I posed it to our presenting group um, about being able to view kind of the winning submissions um, and have kind of a library of winning submissions. And um, I think folks may be open to that. So, um, this year, I'll introduce kind of a submission form question. Should your project be awarded, would you be willing to share this submission um, with other folks so they can they can review it and maybe learn from it? Um, so, so that's kind of a, a no to Susan, but pivoting into something that may, may help in, in another way. Great, thank you. We have a few more minutes. If there are other questions, um, please feel free to unmute yourself and speak up. Hi, um, I'm Katie, uh, and I'm fairly new to this realm, which is why I have so many questions that might sound really basic. But I have kind of a similar question about the, the diagrams as I do as photography. Um, do your firms tend to think about photographers and what shots you want after you've talked about narrative and the message that you'd like the project to convey publicly? Or are the photographs what you take into consideration when you're crafting the narrative? I would say, yeah, I think in, a, in an ideal world, um, the photographs are taken after we've thought about the narrative. Um, especially, and, and I think this can be true of projects at all scales, if you only go into um, a photo shoot wanting to document the project, um, you can turn out with 50, 100 photographs that are really hard to um, distill what the, the strongest images are. Um, so I think that having that idea of the story that you want to tell ahead of time really helps you to narrow your focus um, on taking the best shots, um, fewer, better shots um, that are in support of your story. Um, and especially when, when that can range from, you know, a, an enormous high school building all the way down to, you know, a residential renovation. I think that there's a lot of value in um, knowing what it is you want to capture, because even in a smaller scale project, there are lots of details. Um, there are lots of, um, there are still many stories to tell. So I think that um, the stories really help us to organize the photo shoots in a more efficient way. 
I would agree. I think we have at least a very basic understanding of what the narrative will be, even if we haven't flushed it out yet. Um, for example, if it's an affordable housing project, um, we're going to want to highlight, you know, that narrative um, and, you know, the benefits that it brings to the community that it's in or, um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so we definitely do think about the narrative. Um, we do also have principles kind of work with us. Um, we do scouting shots before um, on, you know, just iPhones, kind of getting an idea of um, what you might want to photograph um, so that you can kind of work with your photographer. And then the photographer selection itself um, is kind of an interesting thing that we like to think about. Um, we have photographers that we use um, for instance, Robert Benson is amazing and we use him on so many of our projects. Um, but for Mass Mocha, we went with Michael Moran because he is uh, he specializes in museums um, and big spaces and he knew he had the eye to capture that. Um, and also we had this idea of what Mass Mocha's story is because it is such a large um, project and it has its own um, history with it. But then I think it is important too to kind of look at the images that you have um, and they can help you then flush out the narrative. Um, and we sometimes go back and we'll do second shots um, if we think we need it. Um, it doesn't have to be a one and done. Um, if you have the means and the time, um, you know, it can kind of be a fluid thing. Yeah, and I, I think being open to um, sometimes our surprising favorite shots are something that the photographer saw on the day that as people who were too familiar with the project, we couldn't um, see a particular frame as being surprising or impressive, but sometimes somebody who's, who's there to photograph it can really capture um, things you weren't expecting, um, especially if they know kind of what the story is that you're trying to tell and they have that kind of in their back pocket. That's correct. The photographers definitely bring their own eye, their own artistry to the, the whole process. And it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> Great. Any other questions? And if not, I'd like to invite Kate Murphy to uh, maybe do a little pitch for our upcoming sessions. Well, I'll give you a, a sneak peek at, at May. In the end of May, we'll be uh, welcoming Lisa Quackenbush, a uh, presentation coach for the AEC industry, uh, to give us some, um, some information about interviews and presenting. Um, she's, she's had a lot of experience, in co experience coaching a lot of firms in the area uh, through interview prep and has uh, um, some very well-honed processes. I'm sure her information will be, will be valuable. Terrific. And thank you, Caitlin, again, for putting your email up in the chat. C Hart, H A R T, at architects.org or awards at architects.org if you have any questions about the submission process for awards. And thanks to everyone again for being here. Thank you, Anna. Discussion. Thank you, Stephanie. It was great to see inside your process. Yeah, it really was. Well done. Well earned and beautiful projects, too. Thanks a lot, everyone. <laughs>